from sunny St. Leonard's on the south coast of the UK, this is the Keto Woman Podcast, brought to you by me, Daisy Brackenhall. Hello, Keto Lovelies. Welcome to episode number 233. Today, I am joined by my good friend and Monday Mindset co-host, Terry Lance, to bring you an episode we actually recorded quite a few months ago now. I'd kind of forgotten that I had it. It was there floating around in the back of my mind. The idea for the episode came from, as you will hear, some some of the videos and different podcasts and things that I've been editing for the fasting method. Loads of really useful information coming in. But just a few of the things that Terry had been discussing really resonated with the starting out keto, but also as you're going along, just, you know, how to deal with people who question you about it, how to deal with anything really from the curious to the downright argumentative, basically, but then also just getting over that initial withdrawal hurdle. And of course, that's that initial withdrawal hurdle, but it's also that repeat withdrawal hurdle when maybe we're, you know, getting back on things, tightening things back up after a period away on holiday or overindulgence in things we don't normally eat, maybe just overindulgence in keto friendly foods. I don't know about you, but I can certainly get into the habit of having things like keto ice cream and nut butters and dark chocolate a little bit too often. And that starts to become a bit of a problem. And when I come to you know, tighten things up a little bit, get a little bit more strict because ultimately I do feel better when I'm eating the majority of the time anyway, a little bit more strictly. It's a little bit challenging because, you know, a big part of me doesn't want to give up those things. Thank you very much. Even if it isn't all the time. So this was designed to be, I mean, it's a Mindset Matters episode, but it was designed to be part of the Keto Curious series, which of course I still haven't finished. I have some notes written down for um, two or three more episode ideas, so I will try and get on with those and bring those to you. Hopefully you will find those interesting. But other than that, very, very quick roundup. I always say that, don't I? Then I ramble on for ages, but I have got to be quick because I've got a Zoom meeting with my lovelies in just a few minutes. I'm finally getting round to starting on some of that building work, only about a month later than I'd planned. Uh, But I really do have to start getting on with it. Or before I know it, the summer is going to have run away with me and it's going to be much, much more difficult to get things done. So I went and got myself a really good mask. I'm a very bad DIYer and in the past I've hardly ever worn a mask when I'm doing things that are very dusty or very stinky you know things like stripping paint and that is really not very good for my health and you know if I'm going to alter my diet and lifestyle to try and improve my health it seems a little bit silly not to bother with a mask so I went and got myself a proper one with proper filters so I can get stuck into doing all the dusty, stinky things that I need to do. I will let you know next time I'm back talking to you how that goes. But I really need to make a concerted effort and get on with things. One of the reasons everything's been dragging along, building work, everything, bringing episodes to you, is I just have not been feeling good for several months now, I'd actually got to a place where I was feeling really good. You might have remembered I was building a regular fasting routine and that is still in place. It still slips and slides a bit here and there. But most of the time I do fast for three days a week. I'm still basically just doing around about um, three days of one meal a day. I haven't progressed past that, but that's okay. It's more important to me just to maintain that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three days a week routine. 
I was feeling really good. I was feeling so good that I'd even considered and went to the extent of trying to find myself a personal trainer to start learning how to do some uh, body weight, weightlifting type exercises. I wanted to, I was very specific with my needs, which is why it wasn't too easy to find somebody. I wanted to work out down by the sea. I've seen some other people doing that with personal trainers, but the people who do it didn't have time at the time I wanted to do it. So I didn't end up booking anything at that time. And then I basically, I fell off a cliff. I had a bagel. I will actually record an episode all about that and and tell you my thoughts and uh, what I think might have happened. And I I don't know 100% that it was the the bagel, the wheat, the gluten that triggered uh, a really bad, actually, for a period of time, depressive episode. But it's basically stayed with me, not as bad as it was to start with. Like I say, I'll come back and I'll talk to you about that because I do have some thoughts and some theories that I've garnered from other people that I think might interest you. Um, But basically, I haven't been feeling good since then, which was really, uh, there was, was, it was just after my sister visited. So it was the end of May. And I've just been struggling to get much of anything done, really, other than just to try and put one foot in front of the other. All sorts of things have been sliding. I've been going to bed late. I've been watching more TV than I have. I think all these kind of things that I use as a distraction and they're reasonably effective as a distraction, but they also cause anxiety, they take up time, they disrupt the really productive and healthy routine that I got in place. I'm even hardly ever going down and swimming in the sea. So you know how much I was enjoying that and how important that's become to me. So uh, that probably gives you an indication of how bad things have got. But, you know, I'm not totally down in the dumps. I know that this will pass. I will pull myself out of it sooner or later, hopefully sooner being the operative word, because my my summer is just sliding by with without enjoying it much at all, really. But there you go. These things happen. Um, there's not an awful lot I can do other than try some of the things I try. But the, the problem is the thing uh, the hole we find ourselves in, I think any anyone who knows what it's like to have depression and anxiety will know where I'm coming from is that you know the things you need to do to help, but you don't feel very much like doing them. So it's this constant sort of push, pull, struggle to get out of it. But sooner or later, I will. And hopefully, uh, you know, things will start getting better. Other than that, dogs are all well. I have hilariously just bought and it arrived today. So we might get to trial it tonight. One of those baby wrap sling carrier things for bets. You might remember months, if not years ago, I tried to find a dog carrier for bets because she often gets very tired when we go out for walks and basically and it ends up with me having to carry her home and that's been happening a lot lately I've been having to carry her nearly all the way home and bearing in mind she weighs about you know a bit more than a sack of cement she weighs 10 11 kilos at least and when she's holding herself away she kind of likes to be held facing forward so you know one of those baby carriers I thought would work I I tried some doggy ones front ones rucksacky ones on the back they just were not working and I've basically just been carrying her and when she's awake and kind of holding herself it's not too bad although it's difficult because I mostly have to do it just with one arm because I've got the other two dogs holding their leads with the with the other hand Um, but someone suggested one of those sort of wrap contraptions which is basically just like a really long piece of cloth that you wrap around yourself in a semi-complicated affair and then you kind of tuck them in and you'll know what I mean if you've seen them if you haven't I'll get someone to take a picture at one point and now I know before you say anything I'm going to look utterly ridiculous (laughs) but Basically, I'm I'm of an age and disposition that I 
don't much care her health and well-being and being able to come out for a walk you know what often happens is that I end up sneaking out and leaving her at home and she really like does like to come with us but on the other hand she can't quite manage it and I can't quite manage carrying her home every time you know she's she's heavy oh I think I started saying didn't I that she kind of holds herself and takes some of the weight but I can feel when she falls asleep because invariably she does fall asleep about halfway home because she suddenly gets a whole lot heavier so it's possible I've been doing it but it's difficult so I figured one of these things one of these contraptions someone um, suggested it to me the other evening in the park might be a good idea so I've bought one I've already tried it out she certainly seems happy with it it's definitely taking some of her weight off me off just that sort of one arm trying to carry her so I'll probably give that a try this evening we've been going out in the evenings because one I've been getting up a bit late and so it's been hot too hot when we've been due to go for a walk but we've also found that going in the evening about eight half past eight the park has been really quiet and Rocket especially seems to really enjoy it you know we don't bump into any of the dogs that he doesn't get on with which is um, less stressful for all of us so we've been going in the evening so I'll give it a try this evening and let you know and I'm sure somebody at some point will take a picture for your amusement so I will post that when I've got one to share with you But other than that, everyone's well. The sun is still shining, although it's a bit windy at the moment and it's been very warm. It has been a very, very hot summer so far. But I said I was going to be quick and of course I wasn't overly quick and now I'm running late for my meeting. So I really must go. Um, I hope you are well and I'll see you back here for uh, a quick sign off at the end. In the meantime, enjoy another Mindset Matters episode with the very wonderful Terry Lance. Welcome back, Terry, to the Keto Woman podcast, another Mindset Matters episode. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me back. Of course, I always love doing these episodes. Well, they are very popular with listeners. As I think I mentioned in our 100th episode on Monday Mindset, one of the things I noticed when I had a quick look-see at the Keto Woman stats was that the top of the favourites lists for episodes were Mindset Matters episodes. So there you go. There we go. People at home enjoy listening to you as much as I do. And I get to listen to you every day at the moment, (laughs) my (laughs) editing. (laughs) I feel like I'm talking to you all the time. (laughs) Pretty soon, you're going to not want to meet with me because it's like, (laughs) I've been listening to you yammering in my head all day, Terry. (laughs) So I thought it would be nice. We're sort of back to the Keto Curious starting off Keto series and I thought it would be nice to have a bit of a chat about a couple of things but really thinking about that getting started with a new way of eating with a lifestyle change how to get through that first withdrawal period I suppose adjustment period getting used to the new way of eating but likely the likelihood is that there's going to be some sort of withdrawal side effects and cravings and things like that but I thought it would be good to again get all this you coming at me from different directions on podcasts and on videos but in some of those videos you were talking about you know the different types of hunger thinking about hunger versus appetite and then also what to say to other people you know, from the curious to the sceptical to the downright hostile, often navigating what we say to other people, how we react to what other people say to us can be quite big stumbling blocks for getting through that adjustment period. You know, we're looking at making this a uh, at least a long-term lifestyle change, not to say that it's going to stay the same as it is when we're first starting off. But, you know, very much what I'm putting out is all about 
a long term change. This isn't just a short term diet thing. So this is something that is going to be helpful, isn't it? All these things are going to be helpful to learn how to navigate going forward. Long introduction there. <laughs> no, it's, it's important, you know, learning how to navigate your internal responses and how to navigate external responses with other people, because those tend to influence people quite a bit. And, you know, it for some of us, I think it makes transitioning into a low carb or ketogenic lifestyle a little bit more challenging when you feel like other people don't understand or don't support you. So definitely think that's a great thing for us to talk about today as well. Can even be enough to make you throw your hands up and say, well, yeah, won't bother then. Absolutely. So you want to start with the hunger piece? Yes, I think so. Why not? Great. I think one of the important pieces of this for everyone to really consider is that probably even more so than any dieting experience they've done in the past, if they are really looking at this as a lifestyle change, it will entail some discomfort. Because anytime we switch from something that we're used to, you know, more than a couple of weeks worth of being used to it, it's challenging. Breaking habits can be challenging. Getting our body and our brain used to new things can be challenging. But as everyone who's been with this lifestyle longer can attest to, it's worth going through those challenges early on. But I think it's important for people going in to have a realistic expectation. There will be challenges without going to the extreme of saying, oh my gosh, this is going to be so hard. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Because as I always say, remember your brain is listening to you and it hears that. So instead to say, I'm going to run into some things that will be challenging and I'm going to need to learn new habits, new skills, so that I can manage those challenges. So first, I think it's important to just go into it with a level set of expectations. There are going to be challenges. They are manageable challenges. I think the other thing, just before you go into that, I was I was thinking about this as I was walking the dogs, how important word choice is and what a big difference. You're talking about the messages you're sending your brain there, but how much of a difference is there between the word struggle and the word challenge? Mm-hmm. And they're kind of similar and it's kind of telling about how you're framing it with the words that you choose to use. Mm -hmm. You know, this is going to be a struggle. I'm going to struggle to give up this or I'm going to struggle to do this. I'm going to struggle to do that. Gosh, you know, letting some of these things go from my life for a period of time to see if this works is going to be a challenge. But we tend to rise to a challenge. Mm -hmm. Challenge is challenging. Challenges are to be met head on. Mm -hmm. Challenges are something that are a bit more exciting, I think, than struggles. Struggles feel like something that kind of pounds you down, holds you down, versus a challenge is something you push up against and move it so that it's not as um, limiting or heavy or whatever. Mm. That's a great distinction. So I think one of the pieces that I really encourage people to think about is this whole concept of hunger and another way of looking at it is desire or appetite. Because what I found after even a short period of time of eating well, which was a lower carbohydrate approach for me, I could go hours and hours without actually needing food. That didn't mean I didn't want food. Mm -hmm. during those hours. I used to joke that if someone said to me, hey, Terry, do you want this food? Or if they said, Terry, are you hungry? I'd probably have different responses. Are you actually hungry? No. Do you want this food? Absolutely. (laughs) That, That never has gone away for me. But I really have had to learn to distinguish between what does it mean to be actually hungry, a need for food, versus... I would like food. It would feel good to eat right now. Food would taste good right now. Those are two very different concepts. And I think most of us for much of our lives have not separated those two things out. 
So I try to think about what is actual hunger and what are actual signals of hunger. Just obsessing about food does not mean that you're hungry. But your brain may be seeking energy. Your brain may be seeking comfort. Your brain may be seeking something to do. That doesn't mean hunger. So I always attribute this to Coach John at the Fasting Method because that's where I first heard someone mention it, that they had heard it from him. But I'm sure he got it somewhere as well. But if you really think about a way to kind of frame up your hunger and check in with yourself, the ones that I would encourage people to to think about are head hunger. So that means I'm thinking about food. I've got this in my mind and it sounds good. And then thinking about heart hunger. I'm emotionally tapped out a little bit right now. I'm sad or I'm scared or I'm lonely or frustrated. And I would like to use food to soothe that. That's heart hunger. And then hand hunger is I'm bored. I'm fidgety. You know, I'm watching TV and what I'm used to doing is sticking my hand in a bag or a container and putting it to my mouth every 10 seconds or so. That's not actual hunger, but that's habit. So hand hunger. And then actual hunger, where the belly is gurgling and showing you signs that it's preparing for food. If you can check in with yourself, when you kind of get that inkling, hmm, I'm hungry. Well, is it head hunger? Is it heart hunger? Is it hand hunger? What, What needs or what sensations am I actually going for here? And then to think about if it's actual hunger, then I can make some choices about what to do about that. If it's other hunger, then I need to make choices not about food related to that. I need to do something else with my hands. I need to find some other coping strategies to deal with that emotional pull. Or I need to give my brain something else to focus on rather than looking at 24 more cheesecake recipes um, (laughs) on social media. So I think that's a really nice beginning for people is just to check out how is this hunger actually affecting me? to differentiate, is it actual physical hunger versus these other signals that we may get? Because actually just identifying it could be enough to not go and eat. I mean, it might be that you then need to replace it with something else. You know, if it's a hands hunger, you might need to be doing something else if it's like you say if if it's a head's hunger it's a bit like when you you know you get a song in your head and you can't get rid of it and you just can't stop thinking about food well you know stop feeding that by looking at the images but I think particularly maybe with the emotional hunger I think actually just realizing Mm -hmm. you know stopping and thinking every time you think you're hungry is just you know, taking a moment, taking a bit of a time out and identifying that hunger to start with. And that will then probably lead you down the path of finding an alternative or just say, oh, okay, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm feeling a bit angry or sad or emotional. And that's enough to for you then to say, yeah, food's not really going to help much with that. Mm-hmm. And that might be enough to break the cycle. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, if it's actual physical hunger, and I think it's become a bit of an old fashioned concept, this concept of building a healthy appetite for your meal. Mm. Yeah, that is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to get hungry. I mean, you you kind of go past a certain point sometimes when you you get too hungry, which, and and then you stop being hungry, which can be advantageous if you, you know, you're talking about fasting. But if you're just trying to get into a new lifestyle of eating two or three meals a day and not snacking in between, and that's the sort of hunger you're trying to hunger in, in quotation marks, trying to work on, this whole building an appetite, actually reconnecting with that feeling of hunger, I think is a good thing. I mean, Mm -hmm. I was disconnected from that for years. I was never 
either truly hungry or truly satisfied. I was just in this sort of limbo land. And I kind of, I've really learned to embrace that feeling of hunger. You know, hunger, obviously, we're not talking about starving hunger here, but we're mm. talking about that natural hunger. I'm sure things like dopamine come into play with the anticipation of your meal. You look forward to your meal. And actually then also when you sit down and eat it, you enjoy it more if you're hungry. Mm -hmm. That, you know, this whole, I'm sure a lot of us have heard from our parents, no, you can't have that because you'll spoil your meal. Mm -hmm. And you do, don't you? If you're not really hungry when you go into your meal, it's not as enjoyable as if you're mm -hmm. really, really hungry. And I, I think uh, you and I could probably take a deep dive um, into this idea at, at a later date. But the idea that we have generally learned through our cultural um, practices and socialization to not allow ourselves to experience anything that's uncomfortable. That as soon as we have an awareness that something is uncomfortable, we should change something. We should do something. And of course, there are uncomfortable painful things that I don't think we should just sit in. But this idea of hunger, people start to think of it as it's too unbearable. If my stomach is rumbly a little bit, I better hurry and eat because it's telling me. And we almost over respond to it. We, like you said, we learn not even to know what's the difference between actual hunger and just, gosh, I've got a few more hours before dinner. And something kind of sounds good. Huge difference between having an appetite for something, something to do, something to taste good versus actual hunger and actual need for food. And I think for a lot of us, one of the things, even with actual hunger that we need to start to kind of parse out a little bit is, do I need to respond to that signal? Because my body is sending me a hunger signal, does this mean I have to eat? because that is certainly what most of us have learned. The first time you get a little bit of a sense of hunger, please eat quickly. And it's okay, you'll eat again in a few hours. And I think when most people really start to transition to a lower carbohydrate or ketogenic diet, one of the goals is that you end up eating less frequently. Not necessarily less food, but there are longer gaps mm. in between because as yeah. your body becomes accustomed to burning more fat for fuel, it's like throwing a log into the fireplace and walking away for many hours versus throwing a few twigs of kindling in every you know hour and a half. And so it is really a natural progression and a hopeful progression that you can start to eat less frequently with this new approach. But you are probably going to experience some discomfort during that, a little bit of tension that arises because you're used to eating. And part of our pattern of eating is habit. Our brain is very driven by habit. If I normally eat at noon, by 1140, my body's mm -hmm. gonna give me hunger signals mm -hmm. to remind me to act on that. So part of what we're experiencing when we're hungry is our body's natural reminder system to reinforce what it still perceives as a life-saving activity. Because think about it, ancestrally, if we didn't eat when food was available, we might not have food for a while. Mm. So you didn't get picky and say, eh, I don't know, I don't think I really want to eat today, or this doesn't really sound that good to me. You ate because you wanted to live. So one, to recognize that the desire to eat, the hunger signals are partly driven by habit. Now, the good thing about things being driven by habit is we can undo that learning, but it's going to take some time. It's going to take some practice. And you might even bump up against a little bit of discomfort as you're doing that. And I think just sometimes leaning into that discomfort a bit with some reframing. There was a really good point you made in one of your videos that I liked. And this was talking more about fasting, but I still think it's applicable to reframing those, you know, actual getting hungry signals if, if you're thinking 
you know, no, I'm not going to eat between my meals and learning to ignore them. You talked about reframing it as your body having all these leftovers. It can snack on. It's got plenty to eat in the meantime until the main event. And I quite like that because, you know, I've been reminding myself of that. Megan talks about the witching hour. That's always been my, you know, mid-afternoon. Oh, I could, yes, I could definitely go and snack on something that's in the cupboard or the fridge now. And, you know, I do have those growing actual physical hunger signals starting to build for the evening meal as well. So it's a sort of a combination of the two. But I've instead of acting on it, instead of downright ignoring them, sort of leaning into them a bit, And just reframing that with what you were saying. Well, actually, no, you know, you can go and snack on some of my body fat in the meantime and wait for the main event. For me, as I as I try to describe that concept to people, I love the way you talk about kind of reframing and leaning into it. I actually encourage people get excited about the fact that you're getting some hunger signals. Mm. (laughs) Because let's face it. Yeah, learn to identify as quite an exciting signal. (laughs) Because how many of us switch to a low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet because we want to lose some body fat? I'd say most of us, right? Or we want to reverse diabetes or whatever our health concern is. So when I'm getting a signal from my body that it wants me to add more fuel because it's running out of fuel, If I go into the old pattern, it's like just cooking more food and putting more leftovers in the refrigerator. My refrigerator is never going to be empty of leftovers, or in this case, body fat, if I just keep putting more food in all the time. So when my body says, hey, Terry, we're running out of energy. We'd like you to give us some more food. And I get excited and say, oh, no, you didn't. I'm not giving you Mm -hmm. food right now. Go eat those leftovers go eat that, you know, cake that I ate two years ago that's still hanging around. That's empowering. My body knows what to do. We actually interfere by giving it food every time we get that inkling that it needs something. By delaying it from getting more food, we actually prompt it to go burn body fat. And I'm pretty sure most of us want that happening. Mm. Yeah, like you say, even if it's not your main motivation, it's more often than not a very pleasant side effect. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think making it an actual positive thing rather than something to dread happening. Mm. I've listened to so many people talk about they'll eat extra in a meal because they're concerned they're going to get hungry later. Well, if you can reframe that, if I get hungry later, that will be awesome because then my body will go in and start burning some body fat. I don't need to worry. I don't need to um, buffer my system right now by eating excess. I can eat just for this meal, an appropriate meal, and risk the experience of getting hungry later and letting my body do that magical work that it's going to do. And for, you know, I would say 99.9% of people listening, there will be another meal available. It's not, I have to eat extra now because I don't know if there will be food. And so again, teaching the brain, there's no panic. There's no danger. If I get hungry at four o'clock and I'm planning to eat at six, I can tolerate that couple of hours. I can turn it around. Mm, Exactly. Well, it's definitely something I've been using. Yeah. So another thought I have about hunger that a lot of times people say, well, how do I really differentiate if it's I really need to eat or I just have an appetite or a desire or an emotional need or whatever? So one thing I always encourage is pick two food items that you can tolerate, they're okay, but that you don't really love. Mm -hmm. So for me, that would be salmon and steamed broccoli. Okay. When I say, Ooh, I'm hungry. And I start heading to the kitchen. I stop myself and say, Terry, would you eat salmon and steamed broccoli right now? Nine times out of 10, my Mm -hmm. answer is going to be no. Maybe not. (laughs) That's right. What I really fancy. (laughs) That means I'm being driven more by 
a, a want of food, a desire, a desire for comfort, a taste, whatever it is, not for actual need of food, then I can turn around, leave the kitchen and work on addressing that or just sitting with that. But using that kind of a less desirable food. Now, if I, you know, Terry, do you want steak and a delicious salad right now? Yes. <laughs> that's not helping me differentiate if it's hunger. So pick something that's kind of a, a food that you don't love, but you will tolerate. So it's not disgusting to you. Mm. And say, but you definitely hungry, eat right? it if you were hungry. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And again, I think a lot of us don't even really have a grasp of if we were really hungry, we would eat things that sound actually disgusting to us because mm -hmm. our body would be so much driving us for the need. And many of us don't really experience that. Mm. So the other thing that people struggle with a lot, I think, is other people, mm. you know, dealing with anything from even just the curious you know, you might feel a bit under pressure to have all the answers. You might just not want people focusing on you and asking you questions to getting a bit more skeptical about it. And again, feeling like you've got to defend it to people being downright hostile. You know, yeah, I've heard of this keto diet and it's, you know, it's only supposed to be for epileptic children and you're, you know, you're going to give yourself a heart attack and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And I know someone who was on keto and they wrecked their metabolism or they did this mm -hmm. and they did that. And it's just like, you know, just I'm just trying to get used to it myself. <laughs> How do we deal with that? Because often it's it's really difficult. Is I certainly find it very difficult to avoid conversations. If someone asks me a question, I feel obliged to answer it. I know this comes under the heading of setting boundaries and things. A lot of us struggle with that. So, you know, you've got some suggestions for how we can navigate some of these difficult or potentially difficult conversations. I know this is one of those examples of this may be easier said than done in certain situations, but I, I think the first tactic I would use is to downplay it. If I walk into a room and say, well, I eat keto, so let's see what I can eat. I've already raised all the red flags and people now are getting all of their defenses going or questions or whatever. Especially now it's mainstream. You know, before it would have been, what is this keto thing? Right. Now it's, well, I know all about keto because I've been, you know, reading about it here and watching about right. it there. And I've got a very strong opinion about it, which right. I'm going to share with you. <laughs> so again, in my sharing anything about it at first, I might not use the label. I might not use specifics. So if someone says, oh, you should really try this lasagna. I might say, you know, lately I haven't been eating pasta because I feel better. It's a way to downplay it and slide it off a little bit to get less of a response. They might say, well, that's weird. I love when I eat lasagna. Well, that's great. It just doesn't work really well for me. Mm. And we can just kind of avoid the more confrontational discussions if we do that. I think especially if we focus on I'm doing this for me. I'm not saying everyone here should do this. I'm not saying lasagna is a horrible food. I feel better when I don't eat pasta. I notice that when I eat pasta, my blood sugar is higher. I get sleepy soon after. I don't feel as well. So I've just been working on not eating it. Someone would almost be kind of identified as being a bully or a jerk if they really push you on that. What do you mean you feel better when you don't eat that? Come on, <laughs> yeah. eat it anyway. You know, eat so my lasagna, damn that's you. That's <laughs> right. So I think just sidestepping it a little bit. Now, this might be a little different, though, if that person has invited you to a meal. They're like, oh, we'd love to have you over for dinner. And then you're stuck with this, oh, my goodness, do I tell them what I eat and what I don't eat? And I'm a big advocate of yes, because you know I use this example a lot as being a vegan. If I were vegan, I would not want to show up and have them make me a great big steak and put it on my plate. Mm. That would be hard for me. And I think it would be maybe even almost embarrassing for them to have made that assumption. Like I don't really like fish. So I let people know if they're inviting me over, oh yeah, I'm going to make some salmon. I say, you know what? That sounds lovely. I don't actually like fish. And then I might offer another option. Would you rather go out to eat or, you know, 
so that they don't have to feel pressured into mm -hmm. cooking what I eat necessarily. But most people, if they're extending an offer to you, to, or an invitation to you, they want to meet your need. So I think it is important to say it. Now, I might not go into every detail, like I don't eat this, I don't eat this, I don't eat this. <laughs> but to say, I don't eat things with pasta, or I don't eat bread, or I don't eat anything with sugar. Get your main categories out there. So just in case they use some seed oil, or just in case they put some legumes in your food, you know, maybe you're not going to be as concerned about that, but get the main categories out there. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, oftentimes, discussions about food come up because we socialize with food. We go to a coffee shop and grab a dessert while we're having coffee. We plan a meal together. We see each other because we're going to a meal. I would encourage you to start offering some other ideas of how to spend time together. Make it less about the food. Or if you meet someone out for coffee and they get a brownie or whatever, you just have your coffee. Aren't you going to have a brownie? Oh, no. I've already eaten today or I'm going to eat in a couple of hours. I don't want to spoil my dinner. Mm -hmm. Again, you don't have to go into a whole explanation and defense of the ketogenic diet to just sidestep it. What happens because I've, I've, um, I've experienced this scenario and I'm sure others have. So go back to that example where you're going out for coffee with a friend and maybe you're used to having cake or sharing cake. That's, you know, that's something that you normally do. So there, you know, they've been looking forward to going for a coffee and a piece of cake and you're not having one. And they sort of naturally maybe feel a bit judged for having one themselves while you're not having one. Well, Oh, come on, have one because I can't have one if you're not having one. Mm. Or perhaps we could share because, you know, I don't feel right about eating one if you're not. How do you deal with that one? <laughs> Again, I would emphasize why it's not something that works for you so that mm. they don't feel judged for themselves. But to say, you know what, I've noticed that when I'm eating sugar, I don't feel well for the rest of the day. Or, you know, last time I saw my doctor, I was diagnosed with prediabetes. And one of the biggest things I can do is to eliminate eating processed foods and sugar. Again, what person is going to say, oh, I know, but who cares if you have prediabetes? Just share this cake with me. Mm. And if that actually is their response, then I might do some reevaluating of that connection. But make it clear, I don't mind at all if you eat it. I just don't feel well when I eat it. So I'm going to pass today. Don't you want just a few bites? No, actually, I don't. But please enjoy it. It looks really good. Mm. Try not to make as big of a deal of it. Pass it off as, you know, I'm okay with this. Yeah, I guess it's trying to take the pressure off and trying to make it 100% clear that there's no judgment on you eating it. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, <laughs> when I've made my point, if you are going to feel judged and you're not going to enjoy it unless I have some too well that's on you <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. don't have yeah it and at some point just, it might be you let's know just if have you coffee <laughs> if you really don't feel comfortable eating that if I'm not eating that mm. you know do you want to go somewhere home? else do you want to go mm. for a walk instead mm. rather than feeling almost bullied to give yeah, in yeah, to yeah. what they want you to do mm. and then I think you know sometimes you're going to just run into people who think they know everything and they their opinion matters and so sometimes I would then just pull out something that kind of stops the conversation. Oh, come on. Just having some cake today won't be a problem. Oh, I wish that were true. But I've noticed every time I eat cake recently, I then end up in the bathroom with diarrhea. I just, it's just not worth it to me today. <laughs> that will probably end that conversation. Certainly should. <laughs> <laughs> like you say, if it doesn't, you maybe need to reevaluate what's going on That's with right. that relationship. That's right. And then the other thing I would just say in general, I look at this as it reminds me of a topic that I learned as a kid. You don't ask certain topics of people. You don't discuss their political beliefs. You don't discuss their religion. You don't discuss or ask how much they make for a living. And I feel like what I eat is like this. I can politely respond and turn the conversation away from it. I don't have to get into a defense of the way I'm eating. So if someone pushes it to say, you know, I kindly just want us to stop here. If the best thing we have to talk about right now is what I'm eating, I think 
we might need to pick some other topics or maybe we're done. Maybe we need to get off the phone or maybe we need to wrap up here because it's not a topic I'm going to put out here on the table for us. If this is my decision and I've not opened it up to other people's opinions or influence, you know, setting a clear boundary. This mm-hmm. is not something I'm going to talk about with you. Yeah. And also just to say, you know, this is something I'm getting to know and get used to myself. You know, I mm-hmm. I don't feel in a position yet to be able to lecture you on the subject. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, it's something I'm getting familiar with myself. Mm-hmm. So, you know, let's have this conversation a few months down the line when I know a bit more about it and give you yep. a bit more information. And you will also have a little more evidence at that time. So let's say you come back a couple months later and you say, well, I've lost 15 pounds doing this. They're probably going to have a little harder time pushing that this is wrong or bad. Um, So definitely delay tactics can be important. Exactly. Well, brilliant. I think as usual, that's some really helpful information and given people things to think about. But could you leave us please with a top tip? I would say a top tip, and I know this is an overused tip, but I think it's really important. Know why you're doing what you're doing. Are you doing keto or low carb because it's a fad or are you doing it because you believe in it and you believe in the results that are possible? If that's the case, then you need to give yourself a chance to prove how well it works for you and doing it inconsistently, giving in here and there, giving into hunger, giving into cravings. It's really not a full commitment to this plan that you say that you believe in. So if you believe in it, give yourself 100% and do it. Even though you reach some points of some discomfort or challenge, rise up and keep doing this for yourself so that you can see those results. Perfect tip. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, as always, for sharing some of your time with us. Very much appreciate it. Thanks, Terry. Very well. Thanks again for having me, Daisy. See you next time. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for staying with me right to the end. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Now, it's time, of course, for the end quote. And, of course, I am back to... (laughs) my tried and trusted and always good with his quotes, James Clear. But I had a feeling that he'd have one that would be fitting for this episode. So here we go. Nearly everything awesome takes longer than you think. Get started and don't worry about the clock. Until next time, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're enjoying your summer. If you're in a part of the world that's enjoying the summer at the moment, if you're on the other side, I hope your winter is not too chilly. So until next time, please take very, very good care and I will see you soon. Bye bye, Keto lovelies.